In 2019, when Amir Shah tabled the Citizenship Amendment Bill, he talked about the failure of uh, Nehru-like Pact of 1950 or the Delhi Pact. He said that if Pakistan had acted uh, in the spirit of the pact, then there would have been no need for the current government to bring the Citizenship Amendment Bill. So what is Nehru-like Pact? But I think before that, we need to clarify what CAA is. You might already know it, but CAA amends the Citizenship Act of 1955 to provide a way for uh, accelerated Indian citizenship to Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains and Parsis who migrated from the neighboring countries of Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. And they have to have crossed the boundaries uh, before 31st December 2014. They are given citizenship on the grounds of religious persecution or the fear of religious persecution in their own countries. It also relaxes the resident requirement for Indian citizenship from uh, 11 years to just 6 years. That is, they don't have to prove that they remained here uh, for 11 years to get citizenship anymore. But if they were here for more than 5 years, they are eligible to get Indian citizenship. But obviously, they need to prove all of these. So now that that is done and tested, let's look at what Nehru like at fact is. And also, this comment made my day. So I just want to share it here. And if you really like the content in this channel, don't forget to subscribe. There are a lot more content coming in the coming weeks. I ensure you that. <laughs> so moving on. Partition followed right after the independence of India from the British. And what ensued was almost uh, uh, an entire year of genocides, mass killings and chaos. Muslims in India crossed the border into what is today Pakistan and Bangladesh and the minorities in these countries or Pakistan came to India. Millions of refugees were created in just a matter of months. And the nehru Likhat Pact or the Delhi Pact of 1950 was the official effort from the part of both governments to regulate this immense refugee crisis. The pact goes like this. The governments of India and Pakistan solemnly agree that each shall ensure to the minorities throughout its territory complete equality of citizenship irrespective of religion as full sense of security in respect of life, culture, property and personal order, freedom of movement within each country and freedom of occupation, speech and worship subject to law and morality. So the minorities in each country were given equal opportunities in all social, economic and political domains without any discrimination. The Prime Minister of India has drawn attention to the fact that these rights are guaranteed to all minorities in India by its constitution and that the Prime Minister of Pakistan has pointed out that similar provision exists in the objective resolution adopted by the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan. And therefore, both governments wish to emphasize that the allegiance and loyalty of the minorities is to the state in which they are citizens and that it is to the government of their own state that they should look for readers of their grievances. Now the nehru Likhat Pact has a lot of bearing on the BJP. Do you know why? Because Shama Prasad Mukherjee who was in the first cabinet uh, resigned because of the nehru Likhat Pact because he realized that this meant doom for the minorities in East and West Pakistan and he resigned from his ministership to join hands with the RSS to create the predecessor of BJP also known as Bharatiya Jan Sangh. He could basically predict everything that was going to happen. <laughs> now we know that the subsequent governments in India made sure that the minorities living here had equal rights and opportunities. But could we say the same about Pakistan? Absolutely not. Now, in August 1966, a Janasangh leader called Niranjan Verma asked to the external affairs minister at that time, Sardar Swaran Singh, 
and he asked three questions. One, what is the current position of the Nehru Laikat Act? Were uh, the both the countries still honoring the pact? And when, since when was Pakistan violating it? And the answer came like this. In India, the rights and security of minorities have been continuously and effectively safeguarded. Pakistan has persistently contravened the provisions of the pact through consistent neglect and harassment of the members of the minority community. The instances of such violations started coming to notice almost immediately after the inception of the pact. And that only continued without reprieve. The minorities in Pakistan reduced from about 23% in 1947 to 3 or 4% by 2020. From 7 lakhs in the 1970s to just about 7,000 uh, in Afghanistan. And in Bangladesh, from 30% in 1947 to less than 7% in 2000s or 2020s. So that means a complete erasure of cultures, communities and religions in these countries. Now that I have gone all the way around the bush, it's time to get back to the point. That is, which are the communities are going to be benefited from the Citizenship Amendment Act, which is now implemented. There are precisely 31,313 refugees settled in different parts of India who will be given citizenship under the CAA. And notice the only according to the Deccan Herald. So they are currently in India as illegal migrants and they must have arrived in India from the time of partition or the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War all through their decades of persecution under Islamic rule. Majnu Kartila is already a Tibetan refugee camp for the Tibetans who crossed over the border when Dalai Lama went into exile in Dharmashala in 1959 to 1960. And towards the banks of Yamuna, it also houses uh, Hindu Pakistani refugees who belong to the Sindhu province. Now the post-partition history of the Sindhu province is just mind-numbingly sad. Please let me know if you want to know more about it. In Majno Kartila, now there are seven, 700 persons uh, living in 170 families. Abysmal condition in which they live in under the constant threat of evacuation is finally over because they are all going to get the citizenship of India. They literally have nowhere else to go. They are Hindus who are supposed to be the part of India, simply that they could not. So why shouldn't we give them the citizenship? And now we come to the main part of this video, the Matwa community or the Namshudra community in West Bengal. Historically, the Matwa community were called Namshudras or Chandalas. And though they constituted 19% of the Hindu Bengali population at the time, they were considered as untouchables or outside the four Varna systems of Hinduism. You know how horrible the caste system and untouchability was in India at one point. So they were considered untouchables and they did the peasant work and lots of menial work to get by and they had no religious or social rights whatsoever. The Rajvanshis are also lower caste Hindus who are also considered untouchables. Their history is once again complicated, we don't need to go into that. But they stood against the International Congress because they felt that they, the INC consisted of caste Hindus or higher caste people and they were more aligned with the Ambedkarite movement. The Namshudras came together as the Matua Mahasangh or the Matua community after its leader Harichand Thakur uh, started a religious or a spiritual emancipation movement. From 1930s, they also started to align themselves with the uh, Muslims because the Dalits and the Muslims were peasants 
who were being exploited and discriminated against by the quote unquote caste Hindus in Bangkok. But then they again had a very complicated relationship. By the end of 1930s, the Matwa community split and the Yogendranath Mandal, who was the leader of one of those factions, called for the Dalit Muslim unity. Because they had common goals, they should stand together and fight against the high class, high caste Hindus. The Matwa community lived in the fringe areas, which is the marshy or muddy tracks of six districts in the eastern part of undivided Bengal, Jasur, Khulna, Faridpur, Dhaka and Mainan Singh. So Yogendranath Mandal agreed that they would become the part of East Pakistan uh, in the partition and maybe because of a consequence of that he was made the first law minister of Pakistan. But he had to resign from his ministership in 1950 after continued mass killings. I mean, people call it rights, but it's not rights, it's mass killings of Hindus, minorities or otherwise in East Pakistan. Now, I searched for a long time for more details on what happened to the Matwa community right after the partition, but I could not find anything much on that. Was it because it was not documented or are people so uninterested to know about what happened to the Hindus or the minorities during partition? I mean, have you heard about the Matwa community or the Rajwanshi community and what happened to them during partition? Have you ever heard anything about what went on in East Pakistan or East Bengal after partition? If you have, please let me know in the comment section because I really feel that there is too little that we know about the eastern side of partition. So what I found was this Wikipedia page. I mean, you guys all hate Wikipedia, but that is what I found. And look at the amount of riots or the places where this mass violence broke out. Now, I have made a video on the 1946 Calcutta killings and the Norkali rights that was spearheaded by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, it's, it's a bit dull, but if you are interested to know more about it, please go and check it out. I will like, give the link here. And the another early piece of documentation that I found was the Yogendranath Mandel's resignation letter in 1950. Both are absolutely harrowing and chilling to read. Total casualties of Dhaka and East Bengal riot were estimated to be in the neighborhood of 10,000 killed. The lamentation of women and children who had lost their all, including near and dear ones, melted my heart. I only asked myself what was coming to Pakistan in the name of Islam. In his resignation letter, he also talks about the Pakistan's utter lack of desire to honor the nehru laikat pact as we discussed before and he painstakingly goes on to describe a land where the hindus are treated like the jews during the nazi holocaust i'm not exaggerating in any way again i, I cannot go on talking about that the nam shudras such as rajbanshis and Mathuas were compelled to relocate to andaman assam then Dandakaranya and even Maharashtra. Many of them later returned to West Bengal and settled in regions bordering East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. People who are now seeking citizenship under the CAA are actually a downtrodden community who were historically discriminated by Hindus and then by Muslims after the partition. But still, the opposition does not even talk about these communities or allow them to have a safe space to live and prosper. This really shows how horrible and how divisive the opposition is in this country. What do you think about the Congress and the left opposing and some people saying that they won't implement <laughs> CAA in their state under this backdrop? I mean, is, does it have any kind of legit legitimacy? 
please let me know in the comment section i am very eager to hear from you all and more videos on very interesting topics are coming in the coming weeks so tune in subscribe to this channel have an awesome time bye bye and also once again thank you for your incredible support hi guys and here is the first book i have written life in a ziploc bag please check it out on amazon or flipkart and it's also available for direct buying from the publisher itself all these links are given in the description grab your copy now thank you